I wanted to talk about your ultimate rider. So just to give this a little bit of context, if you were the, the DS and you could pick in your team your best GC man, yeah. your best time trialist, your best sprinter, climber, and possibly domestique, right. who would you pick each time? Let's start with the GC man. Eddie Merckx, GC leader Easy one. Yeah, has to be for me. Simon? Yeah. Well, I'm only going to look back over sort of throughout my career and maybe just a couple of years leading into that because um, I was kind of starved of cycling. I was a late starter in the sport and then, you know, it was very difficult to follow the sport from Australia. It was, you got, you know, a, a highlights package of a couple of stages of Tour de France um, we're all really exposed to in Australia. So it's only once I, I moved to Europe in sort of, you know, my late teens, nearly 20, mm. um, that I really started to follow the sport and, and sort of started to admire uh, the pros. So looking back over my career as a, as a GC rider, there are a couple of real standouts and I guess... Yes, Contador was always very, very impressive as a GC rider. But I think if you look at the Tour de France in its format these days, you've got to be so complete. So you can't have any any faults. It can't be just an outstanding sprinter or an outstanding time trialist. You've got to be a real all-rounder. And for me, the best all-round GC rider that I witnessed throughout my career was Lance. What about uh, the guys you've ridden well, with? We'll be careful saying that on this show. <laughs> do, you, do you disagree? <laughs> no. Hey, I, I, I've made my comments clear about him over the years, actually. I was going to ask you a question. Who's the, the one that kind of destroyed your expectations of what you thought they were? I mean, who was the loosest GC rider or GC leader that you, you raced with that you thought, God, how's this guy got top 10 in the Tour de France or something? Because I remember one guy that as well, I'm asking, it's a bit yeah. loaded because I raced with him as well and I used to think he was absolutely crazy. Yeah. In your AG2R days, so it's okay. a bit of a loaded question. <laughs> Actually, it probably comes back to that old, uh, a bit on the spectrum of being a bit uh, psychotic. And Christoph Moreau, yeah, yeah, he was, a, yeah, he's a great guy. Oh, he's he a, a lovely man. He yeah, was a just... super generous leader. Like uh, I remember, you get to a Tour de France party at the end of the tour, and he would stand in front of the bar. And he wouldn't let anybody buy a drink. He had to buy, pay everyone's drinks all night. So he was he really looked after people in his team. And I remember a standout thing about Moreau. He would always thank his teammates at the end of the day. And you'd he, say, Christ, Christoph, maybe I, I might have only was able to bring him one bidden throughout the whole day. He's like, yeah, but that bidden, when it came, I really needed it. So thank you. So I, I remember that about it's important. Moreau. It's important as a young rider as well, that sort of stuff, right? I remember that for my entire career. But um, you're also going to go out and kill yourself all over for him the next day too. Absolutely. What about, Brad, the people that you rode with or against, if you had to pick one for the, as, for as the, a GC, for the GC man? Yeah. I used to love riding with Christian Vanderveld. He was um, he'd had a lot of experience riding with Lance and that, obviously, and he'd stepped out of the shadows as a kind of helper and f- tried to forge his own way. He kind of made that breakthrough in the 2008 Tour de France when he got fifth or fourth, I forget which one it was. But he was a lovely guy, very similar, you know, really thankful at the end of the day. And when I made my breakthrough in 2009, he was so supportive towards me, even though he was still our team leader. You know, when he knew that it wasn't happening for himself, he was very quick to sacrifice his own race for me. So, again, you never forget those gestures from people. And, and, mm. and, and Christian Vanderveld was always someone that, that really impressed me as a leader, the way he went about his business. What about uh, sprinters then? I think one man obviously stands out, especially if we're talking Tour de France. But mm. uh, Abdi Japarov is that? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, no, it's cab. It has to be cab. Tash can express. Yeah, I have to. We've got a pre nut meeting, Cav. Well, we're always nice to each other now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm. Uh, I have to go with Cav. Yeah, I mean, he's 30, he's, his record speaks for itself. Thirty stage wins in, in the Tour alone, forgetting the Giro and everything else. And at one time, probably when I was riding those years with him, certainly as world champion when he was world champion at Sky, particularly the Shunzeli, he was the fastest man in the world. There's not many people when you when you do a lead out that you you know nine times out of ten that he's going to win at the end of mm. it. And it was much like that when he won the world title, which is why we pretty much rode for 200k. He only just won it at the end, but it's, it's, it's very very rarely you, you ride for someone where you know, you'd know bet a lot of money or you're certainly a house at the end that they'll probably win if they get it right. 2014 tour on Mark Cavendish, Simon. That first stage into Harrogate coming to the line. The one you knocked uh, him off. You yeah, know? yeah, the yeah. one I knocked him off. <laughs> yeah, I, I shouldered his head, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, what are your memories of that? What did, what did you say to each other after you picked each other up? Off you didn't floor? hurt yourself, did you? Did you break anything? Yeah, there? just some ribs. Yeah. Oh, so you f- you retired there as well, did you? No, I kept going. On. I kept going. We were sort of on a bit of a bare bones Tour de France team, and I was sort of still with broken ribs. I was kind of the best shot of a result, mm. so I was sort of shouldering a fair bit of responsibility going to that tour. But um, yeah, that sort of crash sort of ruined my tour from then on. Like I persisted until stage like seventeen or something, and then I thought oh, I'm not going to get anything else out of suffering through this tour, so I went home then. But um, 
Yeah, as far as sprinters go, I would I would agree. You know, unless you're, you're saying the green jersey is the mark of the best sprinter, mm. and then you know the, my the career, intermediate sprints. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, Cuban was good in his day, wasn't he? He was he was on a part at one time when I wrote my first tours in 2006, and that he was pretty much untouchable as well, Robbie, in those days. And what was impressive about Robbie? He he could find his own way. He didn't need mm. a lead out, and he, he could was climb as very well. Very good. He? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'd seen him finish fourth in a race at the time, Tour of Mediterranean, which to finish up Montferrand, and he finished fourth at Montferrand. Yeah, one right. Day. It was very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as green jersey wins, you can't go past sort of Sagan these days. Yeah, I think we have to um, mention him, don't we? And throughout my career, but quick guys, Cav, he's, 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 his record speaks for itself. We've been talking about Tour de France stages again. Merck's thirty-four. Eno just behind Cav. Uh, Cav on 30 if you were to take away time trials from uh, their respective Palmares then Merckx would be on 17 Tour de France stages Eno would only be on 7 but Cav obviously I know it's all if though isn't it if some, yeah, if some you know I mean, it is what it is at the end of the day and it's a different era it's a different time so, you know you could almost say in some ways that the sprints now are more hectic the stages are faster than back in the day when maybe Merckx was winning bunch sprints and beating the likes of Freddie mm-hmm. Mines and things so it is what it is. I mean, it, it's you know very difficult to compare errors because mm. the sport has changed so much. You mentioned a, a sprinter who could climb then. What about pure climbers? Well, there's so many that you could choose from, really. And climbers have now become kind of real hybrid athletes, you know, mm. like the likes of Valverde finishing eighth in Flanders and yet we'll see him maybe on the podium at the Vuelta at the end of the season. But Pantani, I raced with Pantani. I saw his natural talent on climbs and things. But um, it's a real tough one, that. Yeah, I could say Pantani, but I'll probably pick someone from who I raced with who really used to impress me on the climbs, who made it look so easy, was Andy Schleck. Mm. In his prime, Andy Schleck, 2010, 2011, when he won Liège in 2009. And when he was that good, he made it look easy. And that was always a mark of how great a climber was, I always thought. Simon, what you got for us? Yeah, I was kind of thinking back and... Um and I was really never in the front enough in the in the big races to to witness the the best climbers doing their thing. So it was only from watching uh, watching the replays on TV. But um, a guy like Harass, remember Roberto Tor- Harass, a little Spanish guy. Yeah, I think he won a do he win a Vuelta. You know, I think he was recruited across uh, by Lance to help him in the mountains. Yeah. And I remember just these little guys, and they just dance up the climbs to make it look so easy. I want to talk about the help as well, your domestiques. Brad, let's start with you on this one. Sean Yates, easy one for me. Yeah. Best domestic that ever lived. Why say? Just because he was just an, the respect that people hold him in, the admiration for, for what he did. Yeah. It was always about everyone else. He looked cool doing it, short shorts, big earring, no helmet. Long hair. Yeah. The, you know, and I was my hero when I was growing up, you know. Yeah. As a British rider, it was only him and Chris Boardman. Chris was always talking about heart rates and blood tests. Yates was talking about it's not over to the fat lady sings. That was the difference between the two. Proper polar opposite. Yeah. Simon? Um, I think Mick Rogers. And he was in your he was in your team for the tour. Yeah, um, in but the thing with Mick is Mick at times was good enough to win the tour. I still think what might have happened had he not crashed out in two thousand seven. Yeah. On the run into teen that year. Exactly. When he broke yeah. his collarbone, didn't he? I mean he was in he may have been the first Australian tour winner that year. Yeah. Before Cadell, you know, and Mick then obviously spent the rest of his career riding in the in you know he had his probably his best years in the last few years of his career didn't he when he won his tour stage his yeah, Giro stage yeah um, but he was he was riding for you he was in amazing that, that year Tour de France was, as a as a domestique and he was he was yeah. a guy that was a great team's time trialist he could ride the flats he could mm. ride the mountains he had a cool head on his shoulders yeah. so he could call the shots when he focused on being a domestique he looked like he was one of the best yeah, best I'd seen definitely as as team leader were you ever marking everyone out of the game at the bar insisting that only you buy the drinks. We weren't allowed that. to drink, really, by the time I'd got to that stage. The yeah. game had changed so much. Like, when we won the tour, we didn't drink that night. We flew straight home because we had the Olympics five yeah, days course. later. Um, I crashed out in 2011 with the tour, so I went home. 2010, we had a little celebration at the end, but it, it, it kind of, I don't know, really. I now never rode another tour again after mm. that, but the, the drinking culture thing kind of went out of it by the time we got to Sky, really, because the game had moved on so much. Um, I guess Paris is still a, is a bit of a bit of a tear up for mm. most people when you get to Paris but yeah the sky years it, it became much more business like much more about getting the job done and get drinking when you get home because of because of what you were representing as well in terms mm. of the brand they didn't want people strolling down the Champs-Élysées at three in the morning you know <laughs> being sick and <laughs> so what have you um you mentioned Sean Yates there if we were to pick a rider purely on style and you can't now pick Yates again who yeah. else who well else? Maurizio Fondrius for me yeah. again most stylish man that ever lived why say? Just on the bike. It just it looks so aesthetically made, like he was born on a bike, you know, yeah. just beautiful to watch. Yeah. 
and probably followed closely second by Francesco Moser. Why so with Moser? Again, another one really. If you watched him on Cobblestones, mm. and there's left a few scenes in Sunday in Hell, the famous film from 76, mm. Roubaix, where it's just the top half of his body in the Italian Champs. And his back's, you could, you could make, have a tea party on his back, it's that flat. But he's on cobbles, but you don't get the sense he's riding on cobbles because it looks like he's riding on a flat road, mm. whereas most people riding on cobbles will be shaking up and down and making it look like they're, you know... He's, he's got his own built-in uh, suspension. It's just, you know, always a, a mark of just... Someone aesthetically looks good on a bike. I've always been in love with the romance of that. Simon? For me, Michele Bartoli. Mm. So there's a pretty common theme with the Italians. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, Bartoli... Pazzardo just... was of our generation was also class on a bike, you know. I thought one of you might have said Chippo, too. Yeah, he was, yeah... With yeah. the old skin seat. Yeah, I mean, there's so many. Stephen Roach was yeah. beautiful to watch as well. One more for you. If we're talking about your dream team rider in terms of, of pure psyche, who are we picking? Whose attitude was, was going to win you a race or win you a tour? Well, I'd probably nick Mick Rogers now. You've mentioned it, actually, because <laughs> he was like that. The other one, from a classics point of view, was uh, Matthew Heyman. Mm-hmm. Was always get the best out of the people around him. Whatever his form was, he never really wondered too much about his form. It was always about how the team functioned and that. Mm-hmm. And he was... He wouldn't suffer falls either, you know. He happy to tell someone what he thought if they weren't pulling their weight, and he was he was actually a dream to ride with. Simon, um, for me, probably O'Grady. O'Grady was really good at you know bringing everybody up. The you're, you're just, yeah, you're just, you're just yeah, picking, yeah. <laughs> picking yeah. your mates. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Which no, is but fair. As far as you know, as far as guys that I raced alongside and that were really good, sort of culturally for the team to bring it the best out of everybody. Stewie would definitely bring the best out of everybody. You know, in the teams, he was he was super motivating and mm. he was a guy that I really liked to have alongside me when I was targeting a race but he he would also bring the best out of everyone in the bar afterwards as well like it was it was all work or all play he wouldn't let you go to bed would he <laughs> he'd be stood at the door stopping people leaving the bar 